Hello and welcome everyone to the sample lecture for History Modern Languages. My name is Martin Ruhl. I'm a member of the Department of German here at Cambridge University. Though by training and by practice, I am a historian of modern Germany with a particular interest in the history of the Third Reich. And that's my topic today. Uh, more precisely, my topic is Nazi culture. Many of you will have studied the Third Reich in school or are studying it right now, but you will not have looked at it from a cultural angle, I'm pretty sure. And Nazi culture might seem to many of you as a contradiction in terms, weren't the Nazis a profoundly anti-cultural force in German history, weren't they anti-intellectual, didn't they hate art? Here we see them um, performing one of the notorious book burnings in Berlin in April 1933. Outside commentators similarly have seen National Socialism as anti-cultural. Here is the famous English writer Christopher Isherwood, who spent time in Berlin before and after the Nazi seizure of power, and he says what we have, or what we had in Nazi Germany, was not culture, uh, but merely a perverted nationalistic cult. Some Nazis themselves lent credence to this anti or the seemingly anti-cultural attitude. This is the notorious exclamation um, from a Nazi or Nazi-inspired play of 1933 by Hans Joost, um, indicating, symbolizing um, the idea that Nazism was really about self-assertion violent self-assertion um, and not the search for, the striving for beautiful things. When I hear the word culture, I reach for my revolver. Most historians of the Third Reich have taken comments like that of Hans Joost, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my revolver, at face value, and they brush aside, they ignore Nazi culture as bombastic, kitschy, artistically worthless, or at least not um, worth their time and efforts. And in this context, they often point to the monumental classicizing sculptures of the Nazi artist Arno Breker, one of which we see on this slide. It is true that if you look at certain Nazi paintings, you do get the impression that they are not very worthy or valuable. Here we see a very blunt, you might say, a very obvious representation of uh, Nazi um, ideals of manliness, right? Adonis, the warrior type, rejecting the amorous embraces of Venus in a famous painting of that name uh, by Arthur Kampf of 1939. I want to propose here in this lecture today a different approach. I want to take seriously um, Nazi art, um, Nazi culture, however blunt, however obvious, um, however artistically worthless it might seem to us. And I want to look at sculptures by Breker, like this one here called Bereitschaft or Readiness on the right, or paintings by Eck Eber, very famous. A very influential Nazi painting called The Last Hand Grenade uh, on the left, and investigate what they tell us about particular Nazi attitudes and beliefs. Similarly, I want to look here today with you at Nazi festivals or rallies, like the famous Nuremberg party rallies. You see a photo of a 1938 party rally there in the top left corner. And I want to look with you at Nazi architecture, um, like here on the right. This is a model created um, by Hitler's favorite architect, Albert Speer, uh, based on Hitler's own um, ideas. And I want to examine features like bombast or megalomania and what they can tell us um, about Nazi ideology. Now, if you have 
been to Berlin, you know how big the Brandenburg Gate is. You get an idea of how big this People's Dome or Volkshalle uh, on the right, designed by Hitler, was supposed to be. Now, what does this, um, what does this scale, this enormous scale, tell us uh, about Nazism? That's one of the questions I want to examine here. So I want to make a case for the importance of Nazi culture. I want to argue that it can tell us something valuable, um, insightful, really, uh, about National Socialism, how the Third Reich worked, how it worked on um, the German people. And I want to approach culture in a slightly more general sense, not just beautiful objects, art, architecture, though I will look at those uh, too, um, but also performance, practices like festivals, rituals, uh, ceremonies, and what they tell us about um, the belief systems, um, the, um, the values, the mentalities um, of um, the German people and of the Nazi um, rulers between 33 and 45. I believe this cultural look at the Third Reich complements, importantly complements, the existing explanations that we have for Hitler's hold over the German people. Historians usually um, um, invoke the collaboration of the old elites, the aristocracy, the military, and so on. They mention Hitler's successful managing of the Great Depression. Uh, they mention his early foreign political and military victories. And I think that's not enough. We need something else. I also believe it's not enough. Indeed, it would be wrong to say that the Germans supported Hitler till the bitter end, till May 1945, um, because of the coercion and control exerted on them by the SS and the Gestapo. You see Heinrich Himmler here, the leader of the SS on the left. It is equally short-sighted to simply say that the German people supported National Socialism because of the um, many economic welfareist incentives that the regime offered to them. For instance, the people's car, the Volkswagen, the VW Beetle, a car I'm sure that you are uh, familiar with, which was the people's car really um, affordable to ordinary men and women. So I'm saying that we should take a different um, approach here, or at least an alternative uh, approach. One that um, explains how the Nazis captured the hearts and minds of the German people through cultural means. Now, what are the key tenets, the key beliefs of National Socialism? I've listed them here for you, and I'm not going to go through them one by one. Race, obviously, um, is a principal feature. The idea of the Volksgemeinschaft, or the national community, is one too, a relatively egalitarian society based entirely on racial uh, principles. The emphasis on youth, on masculinity, and point number six at the bottom of this slide, the emphasis on authoritarian charismatic leadership, the so-called Führerprinzip. And the question I want to pose here in this talk today is how were these ideas, these tenets projected culturally? How were they um, disseminated among the German people? And more generally, what role did culture play in turning Germans into Nazis? Let us begin with the idea of charismatic leadership, Hitler as a charismatic leader. Now, what is charisma? I've given you here a famous definition of the concept by the German sociologist Max Weber. And Max Weber says that charisma is really in the eye of the beholder, in the eyes of the followers of the leader. And in their eyes, the leader seems to be endowed with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. Now, how did the Nazis manage to convince the German people that Hitler possessed these qualities? 
how did they manage to convey to the German people that Hitler was, as this propaganda poster from 1932 suggests, the man of destiny, the man destined to lead Germany um, out of the collapsing Weimar Republic. I also want to look at the um, particular performativity, the particular uh, sense of community, order, social harmony, the Volksgemeinschaft, um, projected in and through Nazi rallies, parades, these ritualized uh, events like the Nuremberg Party Rally, an annual event uh, that took place in September. And here we see it actually, a color, photographer, uh, color photography, a very rare color photography that also gives you a sense of the, you might say, color coordination of um, this uh, ceremony. What ideas of community, of togetherness um, were created, constructed in these rallies? And here we see, interestingly, a reenactment of a so-called victory parade um, right after Hitler's so-called seizure of power on the 30th of January 1933, SA columns marching through, marching through uh, the Brandenburg Gate. Interestingly, the NSDAP, the Nazi party, called itself, even though the P in the acronym stands for party, of course, called itself Die Bewegung, the movement. So dynamism, movement, is an important and integral part of the Nazi cultural or symbolic universe. It is never just chaotic movement, it is always controlled movement, movement that is led, that is centered around a particular force, and that force, of course, is Hitler. The Nazis, you might say, aestheticized politics. They turned politics into an art form, and at their rallies, here again we see two images from the so-called Nuremberg Reich party rallies, they um, projected a sense of unity, of absolute harmony. And this idea of unity was predicated on de-individualization. You might say, symbolizing the Nazi idea that du bist nichts, dein Volk ist alles, you are nothing your people or your nation, and for the Nazis that would mean a racially defined nation, is everything. Nazi architecture, often decried for its megalomania, had a important political significance. And this significance, I would say, is to dwarf the individual, to make the individual um, aware of his own worthlessness or insignificance, right? So standing in front of the People's Dome there, we, we see it again on the right, Hitler's model, this never came to be. Um, um, man, individual man, was shown his own worthlessness in the face of the grandeur of the movement, the party, uh, a national socialized Germany. So the idea or ideal of the Volksgemeinschaft, the national community, was profoundly anti-liberal. Liberalism stands for individualism, protecting the rights of the individual. And Nazism says the individual is meaningless, can only be significant, strong, in unity, uh, as create the sense of unity created here at the Nuremberg party rally. Nazism tried to present itself as a movement of the young against the old, an almost generational revolt. It also presented itself as the ultimate expression of the masculine, the manly principle. So a lot of the imagery from the party rallies are focused on men and in particular young men. Here we see two very popular posters, propaganda posters, 
for the Hitler Jugend or Hitler Youth of the Third Reich. The emphasis on youth is part and parcel of a more general message that National Socialism tries to convey, and that is the idea of regeneration. The nation, under its earlier Weimar leaders, had, to be, had become corrupt, or as the Nazis called it, and arted or degenerate, it had to be reborn through National Socialism. The central logo, you might say, um, the central part of Nazi iconology, the swastika, symbolizes just that. It's an old Indo-European uh, symbol or sign, uh, the swastika, meaning renewal or rebirth. And I want you to think here as we discuss National Socialism from a cultural angle. I want you to think of National Socialism as a kind of political religion, as a secular, indeed a very anti-Christian creed or faith. National Socialism, you might say, um, stands for the opposite of Christian values. Christian values being love thy neighbor, meekness, humility, pacifism, right? Nazi. Nazism is the opposite of that in many ways. But the important point here is that Nazism um, takes on board and uses to its own advantage religious imagery, um, religious rituals, celebrations, uh, and creates its own alternative community of um, believers. So like a creed, like a religion, uh, National Socialism is predicated on absolute dogmatic conviction and a certain intolerance, in fact, a very pronounced intolerance towards outsiders, non-believers, or if you want to use another religious term, heretics. So death for the fatherland or for the movement becomes in Nazi, um, in this Nazi symbolic universe, a kind of martyrdom. And Hitler, as you can see on this propaganda poster uh, on the left, is turned into a prophet and indeed a god of this new faith. And you could think of his book, Mein Kampf, as, the kind of, as a kind of Bible of National Socialism. And these rituals, these ceremonies, these rallies and parades, they have a certain cultic quality, and that's how I would like you to to look at them, right? So indoctrination does not happen so much at the intellectual level through reading a pamphlet, say. It happens through practice, through participation in these events, in these mass events. In order to tease out, to, to work out these religious elements of National Socialism, I think we need to approach it culturally. We need to look at Nazi culture. This is something historians have not done enough. This is still a desideratum, still something that needs to be done uh, properly. And it is the kind of work that you would be doing as students of history in modern languages here at Cambridge. You would be looking at a historical phenomenon, the Third Reich, National Socialism, but from a cultural angle rather than a political, historical, or social, or economic historical um, angle. And this is the kind of work I would like you to do um, in your source analysis. It shouldn't take longer than five minutes. I've prepared um, nine um, illustrations, nine figures that I want you to analyze in the light of the things I have said here. I've given you instructions on the, uh, on the following uh, slide. And this brings me to an end here. I hope you enjoyed this talk. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you um, attained a new angle um, on this um, topic. Um, and I very much hope that you will think seriously about applying to Cambridge and applying to um, for this course in particular, History uh, and Modern Languages. Thank you. Have a good summer. Here is the source analysis and um, the, the actual uh, task 
will be distributed to you uh, separately and I want you to look at these um, images um, as I said from a cultural historical point of view um, examining what they can tell us about Nazi ideology and how it worked at the cultural level. Many thanks for your um, attention and uh, please be in touch with any questions uh, that you might have about this topic um, or about uh, history of modern languages more generally uh, via email. My email address is uh, on the very first slide. Thank you and have a great day.